So uh, we had a really busy weekend. I want to thank everybody who came out to the to help at the thrift store. Man, we had we had more volunteers yesterday than I could shake a stick at, and I tried. I shook a stick at each and every one of them, and by the time I got done, my arm was wore out. I don't know how many we had there, but we got a lot done. Uh, we had where's Kim? Is Kim here today? Kim and and uh, Walter came in and they did some. We can't call it construction, but they did some creative design work. Uh, Robin was in, Patty's niece Robin was in, and she organized the whole kitchen area, like all the dishes and stuff, and it's really cool in there. You can light a candle and almost feel like you're in somebody's home. Um, we, we got clearance boxes. If you guys need any stuff, we got $5 boxes of goodies. Just come in and grab a whole box. Don't ask what's in it. Grab it and go. We, we're trying to get a few more boxes out of there. Um, I was going to call everybody up, and, but there would be so many people up here with all the volunteers. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much for volunteering. Thank you for all that donated things. Um, a couple of quick announcements. There's a fellow back there. You can see him with the chapeau. His name is Jason, and he's got, he's got little pieces of artwork he'd like to show you. He's done, and he's looking, to, he's looking to, uh, for a donation for his little artwork. So if you want to uh, take a look at his artwork and support him, he's, it's his way of working himself through life here, right? Good. So welcome. Um, this is his first time here. I want to tell you this, that he came because of our ad that's on Dave's Diner's um, placemats. So that worked. Great investment, huh? I love advertisement that works. Like that, there's this crazy guy on YouTube and on Facebook. He calls himself Crazy Dave, and he does these little clown things and does these little short commercials. He's nuts. But it brings people into the thrift store. And I don't know who he is, but he does a great job. Um, did Mr. Bill Nidum make it in? Has anybody seen Bill Nidum here this morning? I guess it didn't work out. Um, Bill was trying to get transportation. I hope he makes it. Maybe they're just running behind. Um, and the other thing, very important, all of these pens, we had boxes and boxes of these pens. And I'm not yelling at you and I'm not scolding you, but it's time to clean out your junk drawers and bring some pens back. Because if you're a lot like me, they ended up in the car or they ended up back at home on the end table. But bring some pens back. Um, they're great for promotion, but you already know about us. So bring some pens back or hand them out to some friends. But we're running short on pens again, so when you get... When you get the uh, time and think about it, brings pens back. Another announcement. I know we've mentioned these pavers. So I'm going to do this. I'm, it's really hard to keep everything organized because I'm a disaster zone with organization. It's my fault, and I'm taking the blame. I know some people have paid for some pavers, but my failure is there's actually a form to fill out. So starting next week, I will have a stack of forms. So all the questions will be answered. How many letters per line? How many lines can I have? What's the cost? Uh, but next week, these are what the pavers will look like. There is an upcharge if you want some clip art on it, and they have clip art on their website. And uh, this is going to help Patty get her paved area to help do the parking and, and do what she's supposed to do with the city. Don't even mention my frustrations with this city. We're still trying for almost a year now to get the cafe open within the thrift store. We're getting close. Only another $2,600. <laughs> oh, yeah, we do, too. We even know where he lives, but we can't threaten him like that. <laughs> or her. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, Mr. Ed, where's Ed? Wave your hand, Ed. I'm remembering, Ed, tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. every Monday, we have a men's breakfast. It's not a prayer breakfast. It's nothing but a bunch of guys getting together and shooting the breeze and chewing the cheese. How about that? It just came out of my head, just like that. Like, like crazy Dave. He's like coming in. So Pot Belly Deli is at the corner of Orange Avenue and US 1. It's the back side of the arcade building, the one with the multicolored roof. And we'd love to have some more men there. Last week, I think we had five. So if we, could, if we can get like 25, it would be awesome. Maybe we can call it a club. And then we'll, get a, we'll put together a committee and we'll make some decisions. Mm. See, it's scary already. Just come have breakfast. Just come have breakfast. Um, before I do a, um, a shameless plug for my book in the middle of the service, I'm going to tell you I do have some of my books here. I think there's eight or ten here. They're ten bucks a piece. If you like what we teach, it's only because God teaches me. 
and he's helped me to write this little simple book about the simplicity of a genuine faith. So if you're interested in supporting me, I'll take that as well. Ten bucks a copy, shamelessly. If you want it signed, there'll be ink in it and stuff, so that drops the price to 30. <laughs> Let's open up with prayer and get into our service before it gets hot, okay? Um, Father, we just uh, we thank you for the day. We th I thank you for people who just have a heart to seek you. God, as we seek you and as we get still and listen for your voice, as we get still and we look for you in our lives, you, you show up every single time and you show up in a great way. Father, for all of the things that you've given us through the gift of your son, that spirit that comes to live in us and to guide us, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the leadership of your spirit. We thank you for growing us and maturing us in your word and your will. God, it is my biggest desire that each one of us would begin to understand to the best of our ability how deep and how wide and how great your love is for us and that we can trust you with all things, even the things we don't know we can. God, you made us. You know us. We ask you to lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So first treat we have for you this morning is Mr. Rick's going to come up here. You need me to take over on the cameras? Because I don't know what I'm doing. It'll be fun. Maybe, maybe it'll turn into a Crazy Day video for the first three minutes. All right. I can't touch that thing. It'll blow up. Thank you.
Thank you, Rick. Good job. My soul's in your hands. Bring it back to the island style a little bit. I should have put my dreads in. One love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. Hear the children cry. Just to save his own beliefs Singing One love What about the one heart? One heart hey, what about the soul? Let's get together and feel alright As it was in the beginning One love So shall it be in the end One heart Alright, I give thanks and praise to the Lord And I will feel alright We're singing let's From the father of creation, keep singing it. One love, what about the one heart? One heart, hey, what about the Let's soul? Get together and feel alright. I'm pleading to mankind. One love, oh Lord, one heart. One heart, oh yeah. Give thanks and praise to the Lord. And my cue. I don't know where that band was when we practiced it. Everybody know this one? Me too. My life is in you, Lord, and my strength is in you, Lord.
message just in the music. How do you like that? All my life is... No dancing. Tammy's taking off. I'm telling on her now in front of everybody. She's leaving. She's not going to come sing after. She's mad. No, she's going to pray for a safe journeys. Tammy's going on a, on a plane trip and going to a wedding or something, right? Just to travel. Oh, man. The life of leisure that she just leads. It's hard. <laughs> Be safe, Tam. Thanks. Um, so great, great stuff. Um, as you know, we've been studying the book of Luke for several weeks now. I think well over 20, 25 weeks in the book of Luke. And we're going to continue in Luke 19. Um, Pastor Bob's going to come up. And we're going to talk about some pretty interesting things here. Um, well, we'll let Bob start, and then I'll jump in on the bandwagon, see if we can clear it up. Oh, that's right. I'm getting my other wife, another one of my wives. Thanks, hon. Uh, the kids are going to the kids' camper. And it's air-conditioned, kids, if you want to go in there. Wendy's going to take the kids back for Kids Church. Pastor Bob. Let's hear it one more time for Crazy Dave and the Sheilettes. <laughs> Rocking the house this morning at Archie's. Love it. I was thinking we'd been in Luke for quite a while. I've really enjoyed this series, and... Uh, I, I suddenly hit me glancing over this last night that things are ramping up in Luke. We're getting uh, actually quite close to the grand finale, what Jesus, his whole mission was all about. But we find ourselves in Luke 19, starting with verse 11. He's going to give another parable. He's going to give another teaching to his disciples because it says, as they heard these things... And what, what did they hear? He, we just left off last week. He said the Son of Man had come to seek and save that which was lost. See, the, the, the religious ruling class, if you would, they didn't know they were lost. And yet the people 
weren't being fed truth. The people were hungry for truth, just like they are today, by the way. And that's why the masses were flocking to Jesus, because they sensed something real going on. And as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now the disciples and the followers sensed that something was about to happen, but they had a distorted picture in their minds of what was going to happen. They thought Jesus was going to usher in God's kingdom of heaven on earth now. They thought that he was going to come into Jerusalem with pomp and circumstance, that the red carpet was going to be rolled out, that he was going to set himself up and rule. It was like the millennium was going to happen. Jesus was going to be king, and there would be peace on earth. There would be no more oppression, no more poor, no more sickness, no more sorrow. And that's not what was going to happen yet. See, it wasn't quite the way things were going to go for the time being. So Jesus tells them, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now who's he really talking about? He's talking about himself. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas. Now a minus and is actually like a third of a year's income. And the reason I know that, it says in the small print, if you look at your Bible, a lot of versions, and it says down in the footnote that a mina was worth about three months' salary, actually. So it was a lot of money. You know, depending on your salary, it might have been seven to $15,000, this nobleman, this wealthy individual businessman is giving his associates responsibility for and he tells them do business till I come but his citizens hated him and they sent a delegation after him saying we will not have this man to reign over us and so it was that when he returned having received the kingdom he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. So this businessman grants this particular associate who is invested wisely, he gives him a higher position of responsibility. He honors him with this. Then the second man came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he says, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept and put away in a handkerchief. So this guy takes this, his master's money, and instead of investing it, instead of working it, instead of using it to make it multiply, he sticks it away. He wraps it up in a rag and, and puts it on the, in the closet shelf, basically. So huh, he says, he goes on, this associate. He says, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not owe. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? He's saying, even if you're lazy and weren't going to do something with it positive, you could have at least stuck it in the bank. It would have been earning something. Now, I want to add something here because I've heard this somewhere, probably a number of times over the years, and this parable was, is kind of given sometimes as a lesson in finances. 
And maybe there is something you can go that direction, but that's not what I'm, I'm getting out of this this time. It's not a lesson about investing. It's not a lesson about bonds, stocks, mutual funds, any of that kind of stuff. There's something bigger here. But he, he says to those, the master says to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minus, but they complain about it. They said, master, but he has ten minus. He's like, they're like, you've already given him so much. He's already got a bunch of stuff. Why are you giving him more stuff? But he goes on. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. This is, again, Jesus paints a very graphic picture. And it said when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. See, Jesus is staying focused on his mission. But he's teaching these disciples in a very, a very important lesson. And what might that lesson be? Well, we've established that the nobleman was Jesus. And if we look at this from the perspective of what God was doing through Jesus, we see that Jesus came down to the earth. And he fulfilled the prophecy. He was the chosen one of God. He was God's son, birthed in the human flesh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, man and God at the same time. And he fulfilled all that prophecy. He was continuing to fulfill it at this point. And he's getting very close to the ultimate fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies. And yet, the people at large rejected him. Especially the religious rulers, the religious professionals, the religious class that spent their whole life, since they were very young, studying the Torah studying the books that they had of the Bible at that time, studying the Old Testament prophets, the law of Moses, knew it verbatim, pretty much. They knew it like the back of their hand. And yet they missed that the fulfillment of all the Scripture was standing right there in front of them. As it says in John Chapter 1, I think, yeah. Very first chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Is it any wonder that in the world today, a world full of turmoil, wars and rumors of wars, that people are looking at everything and anything to fulfill those soul needs that they don't even know they have. They're looking everywhere except to God in most cases. Today, 2,000 years after Jesus came and fulfilled the mission, so many people, yet a remnant goes out into the world. A remnant is living the light. A remnant is being the light. Well, he's preparing these, his disciples that even though his own, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, whatever name you want, God's chosen ones that through them, through that ancestral line on his human side, Jesus came, they rejected him. And we're going to see in just a few short chapters how grievously they rejected him. Well, you might say, well, I'm not Jewish, so I didn't reject him. Well, the Gentiles rejected him too. It was a Gentile government that commanded that he be nailed. It was Gentiles that actually did the pounding of the nails. 
and it was Gentiles and Jews standing around at the base of the cross as he hung there naked, bleeding, dying for our sin burden. And they wouldn't have this man to reign over them. But he goes back, he goes back to his kingdom. See, in reality, Jesus ascended to heaven. He went back to the Father. But he had these ten in the parable. Originally, it was twelve in actuality. It was twelve disciples and those followers that were with him that went out into the world. Okay? And what were the ten, what were the minas that he gave each one of them? It wasn't money that Jesus gave them. It was the awesome privilege of being handed the responsibility of being the light in the world as he went back to the Father. He left it to them to take the, the good news out into the world. The last words of Jesus on earth in Acts. They were assembled together in Acts chapter 1. Being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they came together, and they again, they asked him. They said, Lord, this is after the resurrection. Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, he had told them, we just read in this parable, he was preparing them that he was going away. And yet, after the resurrection, they thought, well, maybe now, now he's going to do it. Naturally, they would be excited that that would happen immediately. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive peace power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth that I believe is the mina that he gave each one of them each one of them and all of them 11 of the 12 all of them except John who ended up exiled on the island of Patmos except John who had the great revelation, the other 11 died being witnesses for Christ out into the various parts of the world that they went. And succeeding generations carried the torch, took the light further out into the world through dark times in history, very dark times, and they died. They gave their lives being responsible for that which they were entrusted with. Now we just read how he entrusts, how he empowers that which he's entrusted us with. It's by the Spirit. It's not in our own strength. It's not in our own capability. It's in the Spirit. And if you're a believer, you have the Spirit in you. You may not feel like it at every moment. You may not think with it at every moment because we still live in sin-cursed bodies, as John Glenn would say, in a sin-cursed world. But we have that spirit. That's our identity, that spirit that God puts in us. And he guides us by his spirit in union with our spirit. And what has he called us to do? First of all, believe that he's done what he said that he's given us his spirit. In Matthew 25, we get a glimpse of some of what he's called us to do, I believe. In verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is when the kingdom is ushered in. This is when we are resurrected. And he says, come, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, 
and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. That's right. We don't think that when we pass that homeless person or that bum or that person that we're so quick to judge. You know, there used to be a saying when I was in high school, get a job and go to church. And we used to throw that around disparagingly. <clears throat> I saw a young punk that I knew. Like, I was a punk then, too. This guy was really good at being a punk. And uh, we were sitting out in the field smoking cigarettes and whatever, what you weren't supposed to be doing at school or anywhere. And the assistant principal came up behind him and said something. And he said, shut up, get a job, and go to church. <laughs> said it to the wrong person. But sometimes we're too quick to glance over our shoulder and not realize that there's a person there that has a need. What is God calling us to do? I've lived most of my life too busy to really pay attention. Spend a lot of time worrying, what's God want me to do? Well, driving down the road, I wonder what God's plan is for my life. And as a pass by, hungry people, thirsty people, not just for food and water, not just people needing clothes and physical needs. It means that too, clearly. But maybe it's somebody that needs somebody to spend some time with them, to help them out, to listen to them, to get to know them, to understand them, to care. That's loving people like Christ. So the question is, what has God, what has he entrusted us with? More importantly, what has he entrusted me with? What has he entrusted you with? Uh, it's not for those people. Um, it's not what for somebody else. We're quick to see what somebody else should be doing. What has God put on your heart? That's your ministry. Yeah, buddy. All right. Good job, Bob. Interesting that um, it's interesting that it always comes back to the same thing. And, um, and uh, many of the times when we teach on, at the church office, at the ministry center, I will say this in the classes because um, as we're teaching some of this deeper knowledge, it's really not that deep. It's really pretty basic. It's believe on the one who he has sent, listen for his voice, and do what he tells you to do. Um, it's, I, re I really have an awful lot of fun when we have so many volunteers and, and somebody will invariably just get done organizing something in the display case or organizing a room and organizing a shelf and then someone else comes in like, hey, would you mind if I came in and like neaten this up for you? <laughs> and it's like, well, everybody has their own idea of what neatened up and what it's supposed to look like. But, it, but I've come to the decision that, look, if that's what you want to do, Pick an area and go make it happen. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. It, it, did God call you to do that? Yeah, go do it. And, uh, and we come in and we organize and we reorganize and then it gets moved and moved again. But that's all good things. Um, on a deeper level, what I, getting back to what I was saying in my classes, see, God gives us things in the scripture not to straighten out and to teach other people how they're supposed to live, it's so that we can look at our own lives and say, what's going on here, really? Get aware of what's going on in me. When we teach the Alpha Series, it, the, the whole study starts with the first question, who am I? Who am I according to God, and what has he got for me? What's going on in my life, and why do I do the things I do? Uh, Jim over there said, you know, when we finally get up to the pearly gates of heaven, it's not, you know, why do I get in? What have I done to earn it? But I think, the, I think he pointed out a good thing last week. What was your motive behind the things that you did? 
What was going on in your heart? Why did you do those things? Did you do those because I called you? Or did you do those because you thought somehow I was going to put an extra star on your forehead when you got here? For yourself, in other words. So let's, let's back up to the beginning here. Jesus began preparing his disciples for their future ministry. You know, there's lots of ministry. Ministry is basically service to others. There's ministries all over the world in a worldly sense. Different, different uh, governments actually have the ministry of this and the ministry of that. Serving those people, okay? And, he, and Jesus was preparing his people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus was preparing his people, you know. And um, I think it goes to this. Go out and make disciples of me and the reason I wanted to bring that up is I went to a pastor's meeting and they were doing this book on discipleship and I, and um, I'm I don't know if you noticed but I'm a little different than most other pastors <laughs> what does it show <laughs> and when I went in at the time I had the hair down the back and the full beard and I had to cut off jean shorts and kind of a raggedy old shirt because I was working that day and I was a sign painter and uh, I'm Pretty much, you know, I didn't have the suit and the tie, and I didn't have the right haircut or whatever. But I became kind of this little mission of these people were going to save me. I felt like that was their mission, like they're going to help this pastor along to get a hold of what, you know, he should be doing for God. And they were going to do a book study, and it was about discipleship. And I said, well, uh, okay, you got a book, and I understand. But what is, what is, in everybody's opinion, discipleship? And out of 12 or 14 pastors, we went around the room I think 10 of them said, well, to raise people up to be just like me. But the Bible didn't say that. It says, you go out and make disciples of me. Let them to be just like Jesus, not just like me. And I was kind of, I kind of brought it to their attention. And well, you know, you knew what we meant. But semantics is a very important thing. Going out and making a disciple of me, man, if you guys act like me, we're all going down. I would much rather see you be led of Jesus. Because he's got it. He's, per he's the perfect one. He's the one who lived without sin. He's the one who puts the spirit inside of you to lead you and guide you to be like him. I could show you how I perform for him. But don't follow me. It's kind of like somebody I met a few weeks ago. You know, they're talking about the universe and God and the creator. And it's really nice that you have this affinity or an affection for the universe. But I think you forgot about the creator when you're worshiping the creation. And I think that's important to understand. Bob said it and, and actually said it and then went to what we always hear but the original thing that he read from the scripture was I want you to be witnesses to me witnesses to me and then what we often do is oh well we're supposed to be witnesses for God no he said be witnesses to me you witness to me be witnesses to me to what I have done to what I'm doing in your life be a witness to Jesus you don't have to be a witness for Jesus if you're a witness to Jesus. And you've seen what he's doing in your life. And if you'll live according to his spirit, you'll start to develop the fruits of the spirit that only he can develop through you. On to the next blank you have there. There are many who reject him. There will be many who reject you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him in you. It's okay. Don't get offended. He will be given authority over heaven and earth, and he will return. Um, the investment, the mina, the responsibility, what has God got you doing, I think comes down to this next line, and it's important for you, I think. Again, look at this for you. I hear an awful lot of people say, well, you know what? You guys ought to be doing this, this, and this. As a church, you ought to do this, and you ought to do that. And if you have a heart to go do that, jump in and do it. But don't put your heart into my heart, because I'm doing what God called me to do. I know I'm doing it. That's why I'm here. And I'm, I know I'm doing it when we opened up the thrift store, and I know I'm doing it when we go out and, and you serve people. 
and I know I'm doing it when I go to the jail, not because as I do unto the least of these that I'm doing it unto Jesus. It's where God has led me to. Even before I found an avenue for ministry, earlier on in my belief system, when I first got saved, I was in the church. Okay, what do I got to do? What do I got to do for the church? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I know, I'll teach a class. And then people will come and they'll listen to me and they'll know how important I am in the church. And then, and then when they don't show up <laughs> and I get angry because they don't want to follow me, it's a revealing little notice for myself. See, you have to notice what's going on. Well, why are you so upset? Well, because they don't want to come follow me. Aha! Uh -huh. Maybe that's the issue. Well, I was doing it for God. Uh, probably not. Probably not. If you were doing it for God, the result would be joy. John uh, 15, 10, and 11. Read it for yourself. If you're following his commandments, there'll be joy in you pretty basic stuff that was a good little notice litmus test for myself as well Jesus gives his servants purpose and gifts everyone who has accepted this leadership spirit from God has the spirit of Jesus and he has given you a purpose and he's given you a gift do you know what it is do you want to know what it is if you found out what it was what would you do with it would you store it away and say, okay, I got a gift. Thanks, God. I'll keep that under the bed. Or would you invest in what he has for you to do? Not because you have to, but because this gift has value. And maybe you can share it and be a witness to him. Some friends of mine that I knew up in Melbourne, I hadn't seen for a number of years, but every now and then I would bump into them, and they knew who I was back then. I was, you, you don't want to talk about Crazy Dave, whoo, back then. And yet every time they bumped into me on a casual basis, they were like, they didn't understand what was going on in my life, but they knew that I had changed. And, and a lot of them actually said things like, well, you know, he went and got religion, but he'll be back. You know what? If I had gotten religion, they probably would have been right. I would have been back. But I didn't get religion. I got God in my heart. And life changed. And it gave me a sense of peace. And it gave me a sense of, of mercy. And it gave me a sense of compassion that I never realized. And I didn't even realize that by living in a, a life of faith, others saw a change in me. I didn't have to go preach at them. I didn't have to go, do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Are you sure you're saved? Do you? I, didn't, I didn't have to go perform to be a witness to him. I had to be human beings, not human doings, right? And after 8 or 10 or 12 years of being a believer, I had one particular guy who was going through a really hard time with some medical stuff and some relational stuff, and he called me out of the blue, and he says, you know, I don't know what it is, but something's different about you, and I need someone to talk to. And now you've got to understand, this was back in the day. We were both these manly men, you know. We're, we're, we're too ego and macho to ask for help. But here we are 12 years later, and he says, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something that you got that I'm interested in. That's being a witness to him. Living a life because you're free to, that shows where someone else says, man, I don't know what it is. Bob humbles me because he, he says he was all wrapped up in a lot of religion. And every now and he said, you know, that Dave, there's something about the way he's living that I don't understand as a religious person <laughs> because religion isn't the answer. God is the answer. Jesus is the answer. I love that song, too. We don't do it. Jesus is the answer for the world today, and it always has been. He was the answer for me. As a follower of Jesus, I am to utilize my gifts, that's talent, skills, and blessings, with faith in God's provision and his guidance. Utilizing my gifts, I don't, I've run into things sometimes where somebody just lost a loved one or something happened, and I don't know what to say. And the good news is you don't have to know what to say. You have to know who to trust with what to say. God, I don't know what to say here. It's okay. Just be with them. Do what you can. 
be who you are for me. Be a witness to me. John Glenn said something that I think is, it, it'll make you come back and be taken aback, but he said this, and I thought, that's a rather interesting thought. He thinks that every time somebody who's not a believer has the disease of cancer, God allows a believer to have it so that they can be a witness to him and walk through it with a faith that other people don't understand. Look, I'm sick, but this is just a body, and I'm going down. But praise God, I'm still here today. That's a pretty interesting thought. And it's not that God makes a believer do it. But it's kind of like that blind man when the disciples came upon him and they said, what did he do? To, he'd been, he must have been really bad to be struck blind all his life. And Jesus answered and said, no, no, no. He's been blind all of his life so you could see this miracle today. And see, that's that other question. Are you willing to be the blind guy? I, what if that were you? If your gift was, God, my life's miserable. I haven't been able to see for 40 years. And you didn't know it until the day that you were given the gift of sight. Would you be able to rejoice before the day that came we had the gift of sight? Would you be able to trust God beforehand? That's a hard one, isn't it? Don't know. I don't know where your faith is. Um, up at the very top of the next page. When I employ my gifts to offer meaningful assistance to others, I am actively loving Jesus. You're witnessing to him. Ooh, another bringing about witnessing to him. And then they can become just like Jesus as well. Um, interesting I love going through some more of these studies, but we're going through, we just did chapter 2 in Recovery and Grace, and um, I don't know why I just feel like I need to bring this up, but back in the day, if you had a neighbor and you were a Christian, before we had temples and religious places, before we had churches established, a believer was simply somebody who believed and followed Jesus. We didn't go to churches, we didn't go to temples. And if you had a neighbor next door who was a pagan, they actually had several gods, and they'd do a lot of ritualistic things, and they'd go to many different little um, temples and little places of worship, and they'd have to perform certain rituals. And I thought it was interesting. Um, he said back in the day they had a name for people who were Christian believers who didn't, well, who, well what's your religion? He said, well, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, where, where do you go? Uh, we don't go anywhere. We don't have temples. What? Well, what kind of rituals do you do? Well, we really don't do rituals. We just trust the leading spirit of God. And he's, it was interesting because it stuck in my head since Wednesday night. Yeah, they had a word for those people, for Christians back then. You want to know what that word was? Atheists. <laughs> they called us atheists. You don't have a God that we understand. If you don't have to perform and you don't have a temple and you don't have a ritual, then you must not have a God. You must be an atheist. And then Constantine came along and saw the power of belief and faith and said, hey, there's a lot of power in these people who aren't swayed by other people's opinions of whether they have a temple or not, but I want to gain some of that power. I'm going to build them a place to worship. And then it, that's when all that started. All that priests and the madness you guys are showing up here to worship. And you know what? As much as we don't do rituals, I can look at our bulletin and say, we do. We do four songs. We open up with prayer. We make the announcements. We do four songs. Bob gets up and does his thing. It's kind of ritualistic again, isn't it? And we like to say, well, we're non-denominational. Oh, or non-denominational has actually become a denomination. I would like to think interdenominational, and then someone says, well, denominations stink. They separate. God wants us to be united. I think that's our next song, isn't it? Let me look at my playlist. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how God works those things out. So let's do our time out for the trip. And remember, when we do this, this is you examining you, not other people. You know, that guy, I see he's got a gift. I'm not sure why he's not using it. None of your business. <laughs> 
Oh, God, I hate when someone tells me none of my business. Well, it's none of your business. <laughs> I get people ask me all the time, well, why doesn't he do this? Why don't you ask him? Why are you asking me why he's not doing something? I don't know. Well, what does God think? Good question. Why don't you ask God? What's Bob think? Go ask Bob. I don't know what Bob's thinking. That's why they're called thoughts. <laughs> Until they become words. And then I don't even know if he's going to be honest with me. <laughs> if I get honest, right? Nothing personal, Bob, but it's a fact. What's Lou think? I don't know what Lou thinks. Go ask Lou. Maybe he'll tell you. Maybe he won't. Maybe he'll be thinking something completely different and tell you something wrong. But at least you're going to a better source than me. What's God think? Ask him. So let's go. Our time out for the trip in. Do I seek or am I seeking my purpose in God's work? Do I really do that? Or am I, yeah, just a casual show up at church and, hey, this is kind of nice. Not guilt. Just a question that you might want to ask yourself. Am I aware of what spiritual gifts God has given me? I'm beginning to be. I think he's made me a teacher. That's pretty cool. Remember back in the day I told you I used to try and do classes and nobody would show up? That's because I was trying to do it for me. And then God made me a teacher and a leader. Re me a leader? Someone said, you know how you can tell a leader? People gather around. Ah, look at all of you people. I, don't, I never considered myself a leader, but God is doing this. And he, please don't follow me, but follow him in me. Please, not me. I'm not the guy. If I don't show up on a Sunday, don't show up because Dave's not going to be there. God's still going to be here. He might take me home. Then what will y'all do? We have to listen to Bob every week. I don't know about that. <laughs> listen, listen to God. Listen to God. Hear his words. How does God want me? See, I messed up there. Us. How does God want to use, there it is, use me and my gifts? Bad typo there. How does God want to use me and my gifts? What does he want to do with me? I don't know. Ask him. Ask him, God, what do you want me to do with these gifts? What gifts have you given me? Show me. Lead me. Guide me. What a concept. Where did that come from? I've actually had other pastors. Well, where did you get an idea like that? Uh, it's in the Bible? Are you a church leader for how many years? And where would I get a concept about being led of the Spirit? Really? Are you, ask, are you seriously asking that question? That's, and, and it's not a judgment, but it's a concern. Because if they're not being led of God, who are they being led of? And who are they leading and where are they leading them to? I got a short answer, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> This one's a statement. You might want to say it. I am ready to be of service for his will. You might want to start saying that to yourself. I'm ready to be of service. God, what do you want me to do? I'm ready. And then here's a little prayer at the end. God, direct me and use me as you will. I'm listening for your divine guidance, and I trust you fully. There's our organizer, Miss Robin. She made a, such a huge difference in that. You know what? She came in and she... Can I borrow you? Everybody know Robin? I'm not going to relate her to Patty's niece because Robin's Robin. And, and I, you know, but she came in yesterday and organized that kitchen room in there and she put a tree in there and lit candles and, oh, it's so zen. <laughs> Thanks for your help. <laughs> anyway, so, so these are things for you. How are you growing? What's God doing in your life? And if you don't know, ask him. Fair enough? Simple faith. Simple faith. God, what do you want? Um, well, maybe I don't hear his voice. I got a clue for you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they trust me. He's speaking. Listen. Listen. Pray, I believe, is talking to God. Meditate is listening for God. In prayer and meditation, talk to God. We have one mouth and two ears. If you talk to him for five minutes, listen for ten. Just a thought. 
You got twice as many ears as mouse. So if, you, if you're asking him for something, wait for an answer. Listen, he's got an answer. And it might even be no, or it might be wait, or it might be let me grow you some more. I don't know what it is. But don't hide your gift under the bed. Ask him what it is. Ask him how to use it. So as we get ready to close, is anybody set up for communion? I knew there would be. Thank you so much. Michael's back there, and, uh, and Eileen. Yes, she does. She's got a short leg. That's how I know. Um, so back there for communion. The communion table is open to all. Hey, I never did communion. Are you sure I'm clean and holy enough? It doesn't say examine yourself. It says do this in remembrance of what I do for you. He will handle the rest. Let him deal with your holiness. Let him deal with your addictions. Let him deal with your struggles. It's over and over and over in so many recovery programs and 12-step. How do we get rid of these things? We ask God. We ask God. We ask God. We ask God to remove them. We ask God to deal with them. Trust him. He's good at his job. I promise. I'd like to write him a, a letter of referral. He's great at his job. I'd love to have everybody who asked me to, hey, I'm going to use you for a job reference. If they were all Jesus, it would be easy. <laughs> So, as we close in prayer, and we open up some more music, Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I ask that people listen to you. God, if they can't hear your voice, remind them to be still and to know that you're God. You're speaking. If they want to know your will, God, guide them to ask. If they want to know their gift, God, guide them to ask. If they want to know where you're taking them, God, guide them to ask. You, not me. I'm busy enough. I'm still asking. Father, I trust you. You're such a good God to me. I know I can trust you for everybody here. Lead them and guide them as only you can into righteousness. I ask this in Jesus' name, and I say loudly, amen. amen. All right. Here's about being one. No more of that division in the church. Make us one according to his spirit.
That was a good one. <laughs> Just had to put it out there. Um, you know, I talk to people about this that we mentioned about the Lord's Prayer, you know, Our Father which art in heaven is actually an example. It's a sample prayer. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus' prayer was that song that he would make us know that we're one. We're one with Jesus. We're one with the Lord. We're one with one another in spirit. We're one. And that was Jesus' prayer for all of his followers, all of his believers. So we've incorrectly learned the Lord's Prayer when that's really the sample prayer. prayer. So check it out. It's, uh, it's good to know that. But that was Jesus' prayer for you, is that you'd understand on that day that you would know that he is in the Father and we are in him and he is also in us. That's the big picture, knowing that we're protected fully and completely and surrounded by God and Jesus. All right, onwards and upwards. Anybody a Beatle fan? Yeah. No, she's not. My wife, I know, she's a turncoat. <laughs> Told on her.
Did it burn? Did it burn? 
of God. He is a consuming fire in the flames. Burn down deep in my soul. He's a fire. didn't fit the message, huh? Let his flame burn in you. Let it show, let it show, let it show. All right, God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday. What a blessing to be here and share the good news, which is the gospel. God bless y'all.